Uh, and they did a survey of the aviation industry at that time, and they named some major uh, aircraft companies. Uh, I have here in my book, uh, Subquantum Kinetics, I take ep excerpts from this study uh, and uh, just named some companies. It says here, uh, Glenn Martin, with a former uh, company name for Martin Marietta, which is now merged and has a different name. It says, Glenn Martin now feels ready to say in public that they are examining the unified field theory to see what can be done, uh, and so on. Let's see. Then further on, it says here, uh, companies studying the implications of gravitics are said in a new statement to include Glenn Martin, Convair, Sperry Rand, Sikorsky, Bell, Lear, and Clark Electronics. Among companies who have previously evinced interest include Lockheed Douglas and Hiller. And they were calling, the people were writing this uh, aviation studies report, were calling for a Manhattan-style project to develop this, uh, that this was going to change our whole uh, aviation uh, technology. Here, then uh, later in Business Week magazine, uh, they listed an impressive array of companies and institutions backing gravity research, just back in the 50s. And that included Martin, Grumman, Lockheed, Sperry Rand, uh, so on. And uh, also Hughes Aircraft should be added to the list. I do believe that we have uh, technology uh, presently developed in which would allow us to easily uh, navigate the solar system with it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, had bases on uh, Mars and the Moon and were uh, regularly uh, going there with uh, these kinds of craft. If, if you know, we have that ability, let, let's say there was a Roswell crash and it is said that the National Security Agency was formed to keep this all classified. Now, something like that is very emotional experience when uh, suddenly you're, you're government officials and you realize that we've had con that there is extraterrestrial life and they have this advanced technology. And when you become very emotional about something, uh, one reaction is to hide it and then to see how can we use this for ourselves. We, we've got to keep one step ahead of the other countries. Our, uh, at that time, we had the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Um, so uh, this was a rationale, was to use it for uh, military purposes. Now, you know, you can think back. Suppose, a, suppo suppose the same thing happened 100 years ago at the time the automobile was developed. I, I sincerely believe we'd still be driving horse and buggies today because it would be the fear that the automobile could change warfare. It would be a much higher speed travel and uh, obviously we should classify this. Um, at that time there wasn't the same mechanism in place for, uh, we didn't have the NSA and uh, this major program to contain advanced technologies. We think of it as a science, as a scientific discipline. It's based on observation and it's open to change. And one thing I've learned, because uh, I have my, my degree in physics from uh, since 69, at that time I was thinking that it was that way, that it was uh, very objective science. And as you uh, learn more about it and about the people, about the scientists themselves, you realize how much it is a religion. It's very closed uh, to, it's resistive to changing its fundamental principles, like it has relativity as one foundation, uh, um, the energy conservation laws, another key uh, foundation, for example, in the patent office, any chance of, of a new device coming that could help us to solve our energy crisis problem, which has, a, it's getting its energy from someplace that, that uh, the patent examiner doesn't understand where it might be coming from, uh, he immediately thinks, oh, this is a violation of the first law of thermodynamics, which is one of the, these principles the physicists have set up. Um, 
not thinking, well, maybe there is a source of energy that uh, we just haven't discovered. R right now, it doesn't necessarily fit into the uh, physics uh, framework. Uh, instead of thinking that way, they immediately reject it, thinking, well, this fellow is a fraud, or he did his measurements wrong. And uh, so it, it's, it's almost like it's a very religious uh, feeling where the examiners have ascribed to a certain belief system. And anything that challenges that, they will deny its existence. This was a case of a Canadian fellow that had developed a uh, technology for producing enough power to power your house out of something about the size of a shoebox. It was a, a new way of wiring something up, so some sort of nonlinear device. And he was very open about it and publicizing it and trying to find uh, investors to uh, sell the rights. And uh, as I understand the story, his house was one day surrounded by SWAT team and all his stuff was confiscated and he was arrested on the grounds that he was harboring terrorist uh, technology or weaponry. And uh, he was released if he signed something that he would not continue doing work in this area. And uh, so now he's mowing lawns for a living. I mean, th this is kind of a very lame excuse for suppressing this kind of thing. In my opinion, if they are really that frightened about these new technologies, they can always license them, just like you license radio stations or whatever, to keep tabs on it, how much power it produces for what purpose. And I think our uh, current crisis with energy is uh, important enough that uh, <laughs> this is the least they can do instead of uh, arresting people who are trying to help the world. The way I had concluded that B2 may be using the electrogravitics technology of Townsend Brown was through a, uh, an article published in Aviation Week and Space Technology and there were some black project engineers who had disclosed to the uh, editor of the magazine um, about some black project technology that they were aware of. And one of the things they said was in relation to the B-2, that the B-2 charges the leading edge of its wing to a high voltage, and its exhaust is charged to an opposite charge, high voltage charge. And uh, they had given some explanations of how <clears throat> this would help, for example, soften the sonic boom. If, if you charge the leading edge of the wing, which is true. In fact, it's one of the things that Brown had talked about. Also, the exhaust, they were saying how this helps uh, cool the exhaust and disguise the signature, the infrared signature of the exhaust, which is also true. The, they didn't go further to explain the uh, tie-in with electrogravitics. And that's the connection that I made. I realized that this was, in effect, a description of uh, Townsend Brown's patented device, which looked something like this in his uh, patent, which was issued in 1962, <clears throat> his electrokinetics patent, and he was proposing a disc-shaped uh, craft that would uh, use what he called flame jet generators. Uh, these are jet engines that have been converted into sort of giant Van de Graaff generators. He was proposing that you could get develop actually 15 million volts through this technique. In effect, then, the jet becomes your electrical generator. It's, a, in effect, a high-voltage electric generator. And he was saying with that power, you are able to uh, feed the positive side of the generator to the front of your craft and generate your ions, just like he was doing in those small disks that he was testing that were going hundreds of miles per hour, except here you're doing it on a very large scale. This is from subquantum kinetics, and it explains how a particle comes into being, okay, because uh, I'm, the reason I'm talking about this now is that subquantum kinetics allows for the possibility of materialization and dematerialization. Now, but if you were to be able to raise this G, G well, so this su supercritical region, this fertile region, disappeared, um, this particle theoretically would 
dematerialize. We go back to the vacuum condition. Now, uh, in relation to uh, technology of uh, spacecraft, advanced technology, uh, there's, there's stories of how uh, craft can actually dematerialize 